So we started with an example. The last thing we did was look at that example where we took the two standard basis elements and rotated them by 90 degrees and then found the matrix that would perform that operation. So it turns out that if you know what a matrix does or a linear transform transformation does to a basis, then you know what it does to every vector. And we're going to look at that uh, right now. So we'll look at uh, standard basis vectors because they're easier to, uh, the, the multiplications are super easy. So there'll be n basis vectors for Rn. So we'll go E1 will be the first basis vector. That's 1 followed by how many zeros would be here? N. Almost. N minus, one. n minus 1. So n total, so there'd be n minus 1 zeros. And of course, E2 would be 0, 1, followed by a bunch of zeros. And there'd still be n minus 1 zeros, just arranged slightly differently. Uh, now I'm going to write dot, dot, dot. And then En. is all the zeros at the top with the one at the bottom. So those are the standard n basis vectors. <coughs> and then we can write all of our n as the span of this E1, E2, En. So we've seen spans before. That's all we're doing is all linear combinations of those vectors right there. So it'd be super easy. You pick any vector you want it'd be very easy to figure out the linear combination to make your vector. So let's just do a super easy example. I'll do this off to the right side here. All right, so we're gonna take the vector negative one pi square root two. It looks kind of crazy. We're going to use E1, E2, and E3 and write that as a linear combination of those. So E1 is 1, 0, 0, and we'll figure out alpha 1 plus alpha 2, 0, 1, 0, plus alpha 3, 0, 0, 1. All right, what is alpha 1? Negative 1. Negative 1. And I'll just write e, E1 right there. What is alpha 2? is pi e2 plus square root 2 e3. So that would be our super easy linear combination to get that vector in R3. So any questions about what I did here, breaking this down? And the reason I say these are good basis vectors because it takes almost no brain cells to decompose something into a linear combination. You're just picking off first, second, third coordinate like that. If you don't have the standard basis, this step that we just did takes a little more time to get your linear combo. You have to set up a system. You can't just um, eyeball it, basically. Now, if I did set up a linear system, it's a little bit silly. It would look like it would look like this right here. It would already be in reduced uh, form so you could immediately tell what everything was. All right, so that's just really quick review of basis. <clears throat> so we have our standard basis for our n, and we're going to look and see what multiplying left by a matrix A would look like. Multiplying left by A. All right, so the dimensions of E1, how many rows is E1 going to have? N. So I have N rows, and how many columns? One. N by one. So the dimensions of A have to have N columns in it, no matter what. It's got to have N columns. Doesn't uh, matter how many rows are in it. So I'm just going to put the letter M right there. 
So right, right from this, I can see A has N columns. So any questions on that idea? Just looking at the way we multiply. So I'm going to write A in kind of a weird way. I'm going to write it column by column. So I'm going to write it as an augmented matrix. And my last column will be A M. No, A N. Wow. All right. So each of these A1 is the first column of the A matrix. A2 is the second column of the A matrix. A3 is the third column, and et cetera, down to the last column. So here, A1 is first. First column of A, A2 is second, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now we're going to multiply by E1. <clears throat> so remember, we're going across and down. E1, let me write what E1 actually is here. E1 is the 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 matrix or vector. What will I get when I multiply this here? A1. I'm going to get A1. It's kind of hard to see, but as I go across, the only non-zero entry in my vector is in the first position. So I'm going to get 1 times the first element of A1, and then zero everything else out after that. So it'll be the first element of A1 plus zeros. And then when I go to the second row going across A, again, I'm still going down the same vector. So I'll have only the first element in the second position in A1 plus a bunch of zeros after that. And so if you go across all the way and then down, you're going to get just A1 right there. So that's kind of strange, but that's what you get when you multiply. So that's AE1 <coughs> will be A1, the first column of A. What is AE2 going to equal? A2, because that will grab the second. It goes 0 times the first element, plus 1 times the second, plus 0 times all the others. So it's going to grab the second column out. So that's A2. And now we can write dot, 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 AE2. K is a K for any any good K, any K between 1 and N. So any K in the set 1 to N. So it's very easy to see this happening with the standard basis. If you don't have the standard basis, unfortunately, it doesn't act like just grabbing a column and looking like that. But you can look and see what it does to each basis uh, vector, and that will completely determine what it does to every vector. So a linear transformation. is completely determined by what it does to any basis. So we talked about bases, there being multiple bases. There's not just one basis. There are multiple bases or bases. Uh, you can pick any basis and look at what your linear transformation does to that basis. All right, why does this make sense? So what property, so basis, all the elements in a base are linear, linearly independent, but that's not really the property we're using here. The property we're using is the span of the basis is your entire vector space. So that's really the property that we're using. So if you know what it does to every basis element, you can write any vector as a linear combination of your basis vectors, and you know what each of them transform into. <coughs> So 
So let's do another example where we'll, let's get crazy and rotate 180 degrees. And let's get really crazy and go up to three dimensions. So our transformation is going to go from R3 into R3. So what will be the dimensions of the matrix A? One of them better be 3. It's also going into three-dimensional space, so both dimensions are going to be 3. If our dimensions of our spaces don't match, one of them will be the number of rows, the other one will be the number of columns. And you just do a little dimension argument to figure out which is which. So just analyze, think about how you multiply, and then think about which is which. In this case, A is going to be 3 by 3. So if on the transformation, that rotates 180 degrees around the x-axis, and doubles the x-coordinate. So I'm going to do my best to draw a three-dimensional graph. I always forget which one's supposed to come out of the board. Is that the x? Is it x, y, z? Depends on who wrote your book as to how it looks, but is that the way it's usually in physics? I know it's all most you care about. It, no? It works. Everything two dimensional in physics? No, it depends on how you look at it. All right, so we'll just go with this right here. All right, let's use the standard basis to be reasonable. So E1, 1, 0, 0. E2, 0, 1, 0. E3, 0, 0, 1. All right, we're supposed to rotate 180 degrees around the x-axis. So I'm going to draw a little rotation arrow there. Would that, if you think of a, any point on the x-axis, when you rotate it, is it going to move if it's on the x-axis? Nope. So we'll have no effect on points on the x-axis. Uh, so we'll change their z and y coordinates if they're not zero, though. So any point that's not on the x-axis is going to move, and it's going to get its x, uh, its z, and its y coordinates rotated. So let's think about. I'll draw e1, the e1 vector. So it's going to go point directly down the x-axis. I'm drawing these in purple. <coughs> Better move my rotation arrow. So that's E1. So I'll do my rotation arrow here. All right. <clears throat> Is E1 going to be affected by the rotation? No. Nope. What about the other part of the transformation? Doubles the x-coordinate. All right. So that means A, E1, that's A times 1, 0, 0. What will this equal? Two zero zero. So double your x coordinate and don't change your uh, y z coordinate. So any questions on how we did this a e one? So now we're going to look at a e two. And I'm going to draw e two. So e two is going on the y axis. So it's to the right. So there's E2. All right, is E2 going to change? Mm -hmm. Will it be affected by the rotation? Yes. Will it be affected by the doubling of the Z coordinate? <laughs> doubling of the X coordinate, I meant. Nope, it has no X coordinate. Well, it's X coordinate zero, so doubling it's going to give us zero. All right, so write down what 
A E1 should or A E2 should equal. So think about what that rotation does to the coordinates. So what vector is A E2 equal to? It's negative, so it's going to rotate its y coordinate the, into the opposite direction. Now, I didn't say clockwise or counterclockwise. Did that matter? Because we go to halfway, it doesn't matter which way you turn halfway. So you're going to face the same direction. If I didn't go halfway in a rotation, I'd have to tell you which way we were rotating. That would be super important. All right, figure out AE3. So draw AE3 and figure it out right now. So what's it going to do to E3? Make it negative, so it will flip your z coordinate around. All right, so we saw what it does to every basis element. We picked the easy basis elements to be reasonable. All right, I want you to figure out the A matrix now. I'll give you a hint. You know the columns. So I'll give you two minutes. We picked a good basis, so you know the columns. Take a guess at what you think it is, and then test it out on the basis elements. So, and we know A is a three by three matrix. What we just wrote down is A, the columns of A are A1, A2, A3, and you should be able to figure out A1, A2, and A3 pretty quick. So all we had to do was look back at what we wrote down. AE1 equals A1, AE2 equals A2, AE3 equals A3. Just use that fact, and we got A1 already written down, A2 already written down, A3 already written down. So just put those into a matrix as the columns. And that A matrix, 2, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1 is our matrix. And if we look at it, <coughs> If we multiply by it, it's going to have the effect of doubling our z, uh, x coordinate and then negating or reversing the sign of the x, uh, the, the y, and the z coordinate. So that would be the effect of A. Our next example of a linear transformation
So show the projection TA. We'll go from R2 into R. That projects XY onto just X is a linear transformation. So basically what it does, this transformation throws away the Y coordinate, just keeps the X. So it's going to drop down a dimension by throwing away the Y coordinate. Now we call this a projection. If you think about any point in two dimensional space, all it's going to do is basically take it down to the X axis. It's going to ignore the Y coordinate. So one way to think about it, if you think about a garbage compactor and if it could actually compact things to two dimensional, obviously you throw things in a garbage compactor and they get shorter if it's a vertical compactor, but if it could actually become two dimensional, like compacting all the way, You've all taken physics and chemistry, so you know that's mostly impossible, but it can't actually get down to two dimensions. But if you could, that's what a projection would be. Okay, so it's compacting all the way down to the x-axis. So there basically is no more y-axis. All right, there are two properties to be a linear transformation. You have to respect addition, and you have to respect what's the other property. Scalar multiplication. All right, so prove those two right now. You can do it both at the same time. You can check, let's see, alpha, how are we gonna write this? Alpha x1, y1, plus beta x2, y2. So there should be two properties we get. The first one is splitting over addition. So it'll be TA alpha x1 y1 plus TA beta x2 y2. And then hopefully we can pull the alpha out and write as alpha TA x1 y1 plus beta t a x2 y2. All right, so let's prove this right now. And I'm gonna write in vertical form. I don't know why I'm writing as in horizontal form. And just to warn you, when you're helping people in lower math classes, they're probably going to write in horizontal form like I did above. So you're free to write in vertical form if you want to while you're helping them, but most other people are going to write in horizontal form because they haven't taken linear algebra. All right, so I can't, at this point, I can't say that it just splits over addition. So I don't know what TA does to a sum, but what I can do inside here is basically distribute my alpha, distribute my beta, and then add them together. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I don't know what TA does to a sum or scalar multiples, but I know how to deal with scalar multiples and a sum algebraically without applying the T function. So that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. So how do I add these two vectors? It's been a while since we did something this easy. How do we add matrices? Just add the components. It's almost too easy. Mm -hmm. 
now, in this form, I do know what TA does to a two-dimensional vector. It just throws away the Y component. So it's just alpha X1 plus beta X2. So I got that from above, somewhere up there, is a definition of TA. It just took X comma Y. If I write it vertically, the vector X, Y turns it into the number X. So that's all it does. It just grabs the top component and it turns it into just regular number. <coughs> all right, so from here, I can write the first as alpha T A X one comma I could put anything I want in the Y position here because remember it's going to be discarded. I can put anything I want. I could get crazy and put pi in here if I want to, because I like pie. Oh, it's the season for pie too. Delicious. Pumpkin pie. Incoming. Alright. <clears throat> what should I put here that would make more sense? I shouldn't be thinking about pumpkin pie. I could put a zero here, but what I really want, I'll go scroll back up, what I really want is that term there. So I get to choose what I put in for y. Let's put in what we want to be there. So I'm going to put intentionally y1 in there. And then for the second one, I'm going to replace x2 by TA of x2 comma, again, I can put anything I want in here, and what I'm trying to do is build that second term right there. So I'm going to intentionally put a Y2 in there. And look at that. That is exactly what I was trying to prove right there. So we just showed that it is in fact a linear transformation. It has the linear property. All right, so we just showed it's linear, big check mark. So now we're gonna look at function compositions and then we'll look at inverses afterwards. We'll take our first transformation to go from Rm to Rn, and we'll call the first one T, and then we'll have a second linear transformation that'll go from Rn into Rp, and we'll call this one S. So if we write the composition, the function it's a bit strange when you do function compositions. So you do your last function outside, your first function inside. But it's a little weird because when you read left to right, you're reading the opposite order the functions get applied. Functions are applied, t is first and then s is second. The way, but it's written, you read it with a second function first, left to right. So just be aware of function composition, it goes the wrong way. Uh, if you ever heard of reverse Polish notation, sounds kind of silly. Here's how reverse notation looks. Still has the inside out property, but when you read left to right, you actually read the correct order. You read, do the T function and then the S function. But that's okay, we don't do it that way. Like most other things, we do things backwards the way that doesn't make sense. So we're going to stick to that way because we're already we've already gone that way for decades, centuries really. So we'll just keep going. Okay, so that's what the transformation looked like. What dimensions does this go from and to? So there's another way to write composition you can write with a little circle. So you can write it S of T with a little circle in between. 
So if you do S of T, it goes from RM to RP. It basically skips your middle, uh, it skips over RN. So it just goes first to last. So original domain, or the first domain to the second range is where that function will go. So if T is represented by the matrix A, So let's figure out, I want you to figure out the dimensions of A. I'll give you a hint, it's either M by N or N by M. You said to figure what are the dimensions of A, so it makes sense. So find the dimensions of A. So just think of the size of vector you're multiplying and then the size of the vector you're getting after you multiply. So our inputs are m by 1, because we're in Rn. That's the input. The output is n-dimensional, so it's n by 1. And from this, we should be able to get our dimensions of A. So any questions on those two dimensions I've written out there for our m and our n? What dimensions does A have to have? So I definitely have to match my M's right here. And then the outer dimension, if you look at the outer dimensions here, those dimensions are the dimension of your product. So our inners have to be M, our outers are N and 1. All right, so our dimension of A is N by M. That's our matrix A right there. All right, so I want you to figure out dimension of, let's see, T represented by A, if S is represented by, by matrix B, find dimensions of B. All right, so do that right now. should have gotten dimension P by N. So I did the exact same thing, just slightly different letters down there. All right, so now that we know the dimensions of these uh, transforma uh, the matrices that represent our transformations, let's think about the function composition. So I'm going to let We'll just keep going with our letter choice. I'll let C let C represent the uh, S of T transformation. All right, find the dimensions for the matrix C. Find dimensions for the C matrix now. And remember, S of T is going from RM to RP. So this will be N by P or P by M. The dimension of our C matrix has to be P by M. J 
just looking at these dimensions, what is your guess for the way we can compute C if we know A and B? Maybe it's just a product. What order are we allowed to, can we multiply A, B or B, A? Which of these two products dimensionally makes sense? So I'll just write their dimensions underneath. A is N by M, N by M, and then B is P by N, P by N. All right, so which product makes sense? B, A, so A, B, unless M equals P, probably not, but the first one's not gonna work. Second one, dimensionally, perfect, N, N matches up. And if you look, that's our dimension of our intermediate space that we're kind of skipping over. So those inner dimensions are that N right there. It turns out B, A is C. All you do for linear transformation composition is you multiply the two matrices together, and that gives you your matrix C. <coughs> so C is equal to B times A. So transformation composition Let's just go, is the product. So you can multiply your, your matrices that represent your transformations, and that's the same as composing functions. All right, so now, if I multiply two matrices together, do I still have a linear transformation? Is C still a linear transformation? All right, two properties we have to check. Addition, scalar multiplication. So we're gonna look at what is C alpha V plus, we'll go beta W. All right. So I'm gonna do something wrong here. And I'm gonna try to use a red marker. Alpha C V plus beta C W. That's what we're trying to prove, so you can't just assume it. We're trying to show this right here. So that's what we want to show this. All right, we can't just assume it though. Well, what I can use is the fact that C equals VA. So I'm just gonna use that property right there. So C is B A. Uh, a is a linear transformation, so I'm gonna use associativity. So I just reassociated. Now I didn't change order, just change the uh, what will multiply first. Now I can use the fact I know A is linear transformation. So I can apply linear transformation property to the A matrix. So it's gonna be alpha AV plus beta AW. So again, I just use the linear property of A. So it splits up in this linear fashion so any questions on that? So next up, I'm gonna use a linear property of B. So B splits up the same way. I can push it past the addition and scalar multiplication.
Make sure your beta doesn't look like your B. If you're drawing a proper beta, it should have this weird little foot thing that comes off. I exaggerated it like 10 times bigger than it should be, but that should distinguish your beta from your B. And then last step, I'm just going to reassociate, not changing order, just changing the what we multiply first, and then that BA, BA, those are both C. All right, so it does split up over addition and scalar multiplication. I could have at the very first line actually said that on the first line it equals to what's on the right. If I use algebra, what algebraic properties would I use here? If I want to just prove this right away. Remember, C is a matrix. So I can distribute across addition and then pull the scalar in front because scalar multiplication commutes. So if I treat it just like a matrix, I can distribute and then scale, uh, commute my scalars. So as a matrix, I could prove this in less steps. But what I did instead is use the linear transformation properties of the A and the B matrix, um, one at a time. So what you usually learn right after function composition is inverse functions. So that's exactly what we're going to look at next. We've multiplied matrices before, so if I do an example problem where we do a um, linear transformation of a linear transformation function composition, all we're going to be doing is multiplying matrices together. So there's nothing more going on than that. So what we're going to do, uh, instead of an example, is uh, look at inverses. English is bad. Inverse of a linear transformations. Inverse of, uh, let's make it singular. Inverse of a linear transformation. Okay, what type of function has an inverse? That would be true. A matrix has an inverse when the determinant is not zero. And matrices are linear transformations, so that's definitely going to be an important part. But if your function cannot be represented by a matrix, just a function in general, how do you know a function has an inverse? When it's one to one. So that's the important property we need. As in exactly when it is one to one. So what that means, each input has a unique output. So it doesn't share its output with other uh, inputs. So one neat thing with linear transformations, you can look at dimensions. So we've been doing that quite a bit. We'll look at the dimensions first and look at what the restrictions are on the dimensions. <coughs> so let's say your linear transformation, we'll stick with T as our transformation. Rm into Rn. Let's say you lose dimensions. Let's say your easiest example I can think of go from two dimensions down to one dimension. If you lose a dimension, your function will never be one to one. So if you drop a dimension, your function will not be one to one. Uh, you can, if your dimension increases, you can have a one-to-one -one function, but the problem is you won't have your full range. You won't hit everything in your range. Uh, so if you try to turn the function backwards, there'll be elements you didn't hit 
that will not map back to where they started because they never actually got hit by your function. So what that means is your dimensions have to match. So one requirement m has to equal n and what that enforces is the matrix that represents t has to be square. Well, we know every squared matrix has a determinant, so that's going to play an important role here. So T must represent by squared matrix. Uh, if T inverse exists, then what would I get if I applied T T inverse of X? I wouldn't quite get one. X. I would get x. You could say it's one x or identity. So I would I would get x normally. Uh, I'm going to write this as <coughs> identity times x because we know the identity matrix doesn't change a vector when you multiply by the identity. Now I'm going to reassociate. like this and you can see exactly what T T inverse should equal T the matrix that represents T times the matrix that represents T inverse needs to equal the identity so let a represent the matrix T and B represent T inverse so then we have a times b x equals the identity times x so a b equals the identity so this means a and b are inverse matrices that's all this says right here This is where I have to leave you today. But as long as your matrix is invertible, this B matrix will exist. And we know how to find inverse matrices.